Let me say that it's uh, good to be back with you and good to be back to the United States. Got off the airplane at about uh, oh, 06 o'clock on Wednesday night and I thought, my, how green, how clean, how pretty. <laughs> and you that have been foreign countries know what I'm talking about, don't you? Uh, the, and the roads are smooth, too. <laughs> And we complain and we fuss, but the real issue is that there are blessings that we still have here in this country that we take for granted. I want to thank you for praying for me and for giving some of you gave uh, to help us in our conference. I do have a copy of the conference book that we celebrated, Jim Starr's 23 years really of Vision 2020 Asia and transferred over now to Mike Privet as the director. Uh, there's some interesting things in here. We dedicated this book to Jerry and Barbara Gass, and uh, we will be having a report next Sunday evening. Uh, Brother Starr and I will be giving a, a report in the Sunday evening service. I hope you'll come and bring others because there's really some interesting testimonies I think you'll want to hear, and one that I just, uh, Jim Starr has found out about himself. A lot of people don't know Jim's background. Jim is a, an evangelist in his gifting. That's what he is. He's a very go-getter, visionary sort of person. But if you knew his background, you'd have no idea that really uh, where he came from and what God has done with this man. And uh, the people over there look at him as <clears throat> a equivalent to William Pettigrew who took the gospel into Northeast India that he is now stirring missions and evangelism in their country like they have not had since William Pettigrew. By the way, if we need to open the door for air, feel free to do that. It, 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 you know, that may be where we end. Uh, thank you for your prayers. Uh, I was, had only one night that I was sick in the stomach, and that's what everybody is concerned about when they go to India and other third world countries. and. It was short-lived, I only had to miss one morning of teaching on uh, Monday morning that week. Had the opportunity to teach and preach in about 10 days time, about, I calculated about 30 hours worth. And uh, we saw literally in the services I was preaching, scores of people trusting Christ. Uh, even more Christians getting right with God. So you had answer to prayer. Uh, and we'll talk more in details about that. Had the privilege of teaching two block classes in a Bible college for credit to them. And then uh, finished off on a pastor's conference in Assam. And uh, it, it was something I, I thought of it. There's supposed to be 55 men that this one guy has sent out and trained. He's one of our VBN guys. He's 47, and he's trained over 100 young men uh, or men to go to different places, church planning in his country that needs the gospel desperately, a psalm. And uh, we had about 35 pastors. There was supposed to be 55, but the rain came heavy, and they drive motorcycles, a lot of them, and they get the heavy torrential rain. They couldn't make it. But I, I'll never forget the eyes of the younger men tended to sit over here and some of the veteran guys over here and these eyes over here as I was giving them just basic things. Yeah, Brother Monroe, you know what this is and their eyes are just fixed and now I've been teaching them for three and a half hours going to four hours and they're still focused. I mean, they just, they just soak everything in that you can give them. And what a blessing. So thank you for your part in prayer and giving. <clears throat> this morning, I want to say that as we sang Just As I Am, I thought of uh, how I came to Christ at age 10 and a half. You remember that day and the meaning of the gospel. Paul said, I delivered unto you, first of all, which that I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that's what we're looking at this week. 
Uh, we have a picture in our din, uh, what we, you'd call family room, uh, there of my son and me, my oldest son, at the place of Calvary and the empty tomb. And that's one of my favorite pictures of all time. We have our arms around one another. We're father and son, but we're brothers because of that empty tomb and, and that Calvary, Gordon's Calvary. And I just, that, that's my favorite place when you go to the Holy Land. I mean, it just is my favorite. But we ought to go there in our hearts whether we go there visually. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is what we're going to celebrate this week at the beginning of the week. And that is the thing that the disciples mourned over. Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified. And they locked in on that. And just like we say, Hosanna, save now. You're supposed to deliver us from the Romans. They wept. They got focused on it. And they didn't catch where it ends up. <clears throat> and after three days, I'm going to be raised out of the grave. Now, stop and think about it. They were so sorrowful, torn up, because they could only see his death. But thank God that's not where the story ends. Now, it begins there, but it doesn't end there. And they couldn't rejoice. We rejoice when we think of his death and our death, resurrection's coming. And what a joy and comfort. But the meaning of Christ's death, we're going to look at Isaiah 52 and 53. This is one that I would like to just say that in our worldview, we as Christians have a different worldview than the world has. And people of the world, what does the meaning of Christ's death have to them or his life? What does his death or his life mean to people of the world? And I've picked out four of them today that we want to start with. People of the world like Flavius Josephus. We know him as Josephus, the one that wrote the antiquities of the Jews, the wars of the Jews. Or Albert Einstein. Or Tom Brady. Or would you take... Vladimir Putin, what do they think about Christ's life and death? Or what did they think? Well, I want to start with you today that uh, this man, Flavius Josephus, was born right about the time Christ was crucified, and he wrote the Antiquities of the Jews in 93, 94 A.D., close to when John the Revelator was writing the last book of the New Testament. And what was this man like? Well, he was a Jew. And he would tell you he was, but in his antiquities, in chap which it would be book 18 and chapter 3, he mentions Christ dying in Jerusalem. So he looked at Christ's death and resurrection as historical fact. He brings up John the Baptist in uh, uh, book 20. He brings up James, the brother of John, I mean of Jesus, being stoned. So he establishes these people in the Bible as factual persons. He established, he's known in his, what is called testimony of this man, was that he actually talks of the resurrection of Christ. And many people go to that and say, here's one of the testimonies, besides the 500 that saw him, here's a non-Christian talking about the resurrection of Christ in his book. So he looked at the life and death of Christ as factual. Did he get saved? No. No indication of that. But he believed it a historical fact. When we think of Albert Einstein, we all have the you know, theory of relativity and all of that that we think of about this man and we think of a genius. And here's what his response when questioned about that. He says, I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Then Einstein was asked if he accepted the historical existence of Jesus, to which he replied, yes, unquestionably. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. 
Now, what did Einstein actually believe, though? Einstein was a individual that he would call himself an agnostic, that he did not believe in a personal God. But he felt the presence. A sad reality, a lot of people go through emotional experiences, feeling something about Christ, but never come to accept him for who he was. We have a man that believed in historical Jesus, a man that believed in the presence of Jesus when the Gospels were written, but neither one really believers would never claim to have been a believer. Well, how about Tom Brady? That's a little more contemporary, isn't it? We know of him as a football player that has outlived every quarterback and outdistanced every quarterback in the NFL, basically. And we look at him and he retired. We knew he was going to come back. <laughs> you know, beg me to come back. I want to be the ultimate hero. Beg me to come back. Southern California was where he was born. He was raised a Catholic, staunch Catholic parents. And he would have early on in his life said that he believed in the Bible and was Christian, but not now. Fame has gotten to him like many people in the world, and it doesn't fit into the lifestyle. Now, what would he believe? Well, he would take the approach that is present-day American approach. We need to be tolerant. We need to be accepting. We don't run other people's beliefs down. Everybody has the right to believe what they want to, and their belief is as good as mine. So he's an omnist. And what is an omnist? Well, omni, all religions, are equally valuable. And that's what Tom Brady believes about the life and death of Christ. It's a good belief. If you want to believe that, your other beliefs, Muslims, Jews, whatever, you you got a good belief too, I, I accept you. Isn't that wonderful? Offend nobody, be popular. Why? Because you are an NFL achiever. Well, how about Vladimir Putin? Now, this is going to surprise you a bit because some of you view him as a Hitler already in the making. But what does Vladimir Putin believe about Jesus? The debate that is going on right now is whether this is a military war or a holy religious world that Putin is putting out. He started out as an atheist, but he would call himself a Christian today. In fact, in Russia, 71% of the people in Russia claim to be Orthodox Russian believers. 78% in Ukraine. And the debate that is going on, this man was himself baptized, maybe again, in 2018 in a cold lake, emulating the Feast of Epiphany for the Christian Orthodox Church. Some of you said, what? This monster? It may be that he views Kev as like Jews view Jerusalem. We've got to get Jerusalem back as Jews in order to establish the orthodox belief that we have of us with our Messiah reigning in Jerusalem. Some of you say, this is hard to get my mind around. Is he really fighting a religious war? Some people believe that's exactly what he's doing. He's taking over Ukraine, recapturing the center of the Orthodox Church. So does he believe in Christ? Yeah, absolutely. As an Orthodox, he would. What does he believe about him? Well, I'm not sure exactly what all he believes about him, but I'm just going to say today, everybody has their beliefs about Christ's life and death. But I want to say something, at Christ's death, there we see in this chapter of Isaiah, what the Jews believed at that time. What did they think about Christ on a cross that we're going to celebrate this coming week? Some of you are going to celebrate it Thursday, some are going to celebrate it Friday. And we'll not go into that argument, what day did Christ die? I have my opinions. You have your opinion, and I'm like Tom Brady. Your opinion is as good as mine, all right? <laughs> you understand where we're at today? 
Well, here it is. This is what they thought, the Jews as a whole, the day Christ was crucified, Passover. It says in verse 3 of Isaiah 53, he is despised and rejected of men. They rejected him. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid our faces as it were from him. <laughs> we don't want to have anything to do with this criminal. He deserves to die. He was despised. We despised him. We mocked him. And we esteemed him not. Do you realize this is a prophetic prediction of what the Jews are going to remember about what they did with Christ. Isaiah 53 is a prophecy as the Jews look back and say this is what we did to him. He's now come back. We pierced his and now we recognize he was the Messiah and this is what they're saying. We esteemed him not. And then their conclusion was surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. That's what they're going to say in the future. But when we did it, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. You know what the Jews thought when they put him? He said, he's getting what he deserves from God. God is destroying this man on the cross. That's how they viewed it. He was smitten and stricken of our God. But one day they're going to say, oh no, he bore our griefs. And he carried our sorrows. The Jews as a nation on the Day of Atonement, in the future, as Revelation 1 talks about, those seeing that pierced him are going to mourn. Oh, we killed him. We thought God was killing him, but was, he was dying for our sins. And so we see that the Jews scorned Christ in his suffering, believing he, he was being punished of God for his sin, not our sin. But one day they will see it differently. And their leaders there that day were relieved that he was a threat no longer to their leadership. They envied him because he was taking over their influence and their leadership. And so they were relieved. That troublemaker, he's out of the way. One day those Jews will confess he was wounded for their transgressions and bruised for their iniquities and so forth. According to Isaiah, we see right here what it amounts to. Now, having said that, there's another person that we want to look at, at the passion of Christ, and what his thoughts were. And today I want you to look at through the eyes of God the Father. What do you think his thoughts were this coming Thursday or Friday when his son. Now Mike Privet is preaching a message over at Summit View Baptist this morning that he said Jesus entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday knowing it was the last week he would live on planet earth. Jesus every year celebrated his death rather than a birthday but his death day at the Passover but now Palm Sunday knows that he's going to die on a cross. And what thoughts went through his mind, but he said, if you only have a week to live, what would your thoughts be this week? <laughs> That's a good one. What would we be doing this week? Well, Martin Luther said that if he, had, he knew he, Jesus was coming tomorrow to take him, he said, I'd still plant my apple tree. I would do duty. I would occupy until he comes in every way, is what Martin Luther said. But what would you do if you knew this was your last week? Well, Jesus knew it was his last week, and he had an agenda. But we want to look at God the Father. With reference to God the Father, we're going to look in verses 6 through 12 in a moment. But I want to read to you, God the Father laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. What was our iniquity? It says in verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. Do you realize that's the essence of sin? My way, God, not your way. That's iniquity. That's perversity. The Hebrew word means perverseness. And our perverseness is not your way, God, my way. 
Okay, whether it's a Cain, his own way to worship God, whether it's my way to get saved, as Pastor mentioned this morning, my way, my money, my traditions, my efforts, yeah, my achievements will get me there. No, no, no. God's way. And so he says, he laid on him the iniquity of us all. Think of that. He laid, God was laying on Christ. But you know what it says? It pleased God the Father to bruise Jesus. Jesus was pleased. Passover day. Making Jesus' soul an offering for our sin. Pleased him. Get that. Boy, that's hard to think, isn't it? Take your own son, put him out in the backyard and crucify him for your neighbor's sins. Oh, no, 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 we couldn't handle that, could we? But please the Lord. And he also was pleased to say, I'm going to prosper him because his holy justice, my holy justice was satisfied by the travail of his soul. God was satisfied that day in his holy, righteous justice. That's called propitiation. The Father will one day divide all the spoils with him that he deserves in a victory celebration. And God the Father is looking at that celebration day. We had a celebration days over in India, what God has done over there. And we sing to God be the glory, great things he has done. And that was a theme song. And great is thy faithfulness. But God is saying, one day every knee is going to bow to you, son. And every tongue is going to confess that your Lord Jehovah to the glory of God me. And he, looked, he was thinking of that as we look at it here. So let's read it. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. That's Jesus. He brought out as a lamb, yet the slaughter, and he as sheep before a shearer is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He suffered silently. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. He's not going to have any children or descendants. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in death because he had done no violence, neither was deceit in his mouth. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord, God the Father, to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. Oh, the seed is us that get saved and are a part of the family of God. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, looking at his son writhing on that cross. And he says, and he shall be satisfied. My, satisfied, his holy justice. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. God the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased at the baptism of Jesus. Jesus hadn't done anything but lived as a human being on earth. And after he had lived 30 years, God the Father says, I'm pleased with his son. He's been a perfect son on earth. A perfect son in eternity. Then it comes to the end of his ministry life. Before he comes to Jerusalem and he's transfigured and he's going to be the king. And his disciples saw his kingly transfiguration on that mountain of transfiguration and he said once again this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased hear ye him but on the day that we're celebrating this week can't you just hear God the Father saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased that's what Isaiah 53 says 
God the Father said about Jesus. Wow. And then we look at God the Son. God the Son at Calvary was prudent servant, doing his Father's will with joy. He was fully surrendered. Not my will, but thy will be done. He prayed in the garden. Suffering silently, as a lamb dumb before her shears, opens not the mouth. He didn't protest what was being done against him. If you and I were being treated so unfairly, don't you think we'd be crying out, unfair, unfair, like our kids are crying out when they're this age. This is not fair. He didn't make any complaint. Silently, suffering to be our substitutionary sacrifice. While he bore our iniquities. And so we have read that very fact about him. In chapter 52 and 13 it says, Behold my servant, that's Jesus, my son's servant shall deal prudently. Oh, he was wise in choosing to do the Father's will. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was marred above that of any man. Do you realize the pictures we see of the crucifixion of Christ have no way come close. His face and image was so beaten up you couldn't recognize he was human. That's what it's saying here. He was torn up so badly by those Roman soldiers and those that buffeted him. His visage was marred above that of a man and his form more than the sons of men. But it says, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which hath not been told them, they shall see. And that which they have not heard, they shall consider. There's coming a day, the Gentiles and all of the kings that says, we'll not have this man to reign over us. They're going to say, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. All the suffering of Christ and yet the glory contrast. Well, I want to look at this with you. Jesus had joy at Calvary. It says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame, counting all the shame as nothing. Literally, the Greek word means despising means to reckon it to be nothing. My, all of that is nothing? Why? In the light of the joy that he had. We sometimes forget about the joy of Jesus at Calvary. Have you ever really thought about that? We think of his agony and his suffering. But inside his soul he had a joy because he was doing his Father's will. He was pleasing him and he said, I came to do his will and I've done it. I'm doing it. And then the other thing, he could look through the quarters of eternity, I think, and see us in this room that we're going to be saved by his sacrifice. And he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Hallelujah. The joy of Jesus on Calvary. Yes, he honored his father. And now he's going to also, I think, see that he's going to be sitting on the right hand of God, the seat of honor for all eternity. <laughs> The joy of Jesus, the thoughts he had at Calvary for his Father, for us, as well as himself. The thoughts of the death for himself. Have you ever thought about the Holy Spirit? What did the Holy Spirit think that day that he was nailed to a cross? Same as the Father. Pardon? Did he feel the same as the Father? Yeah, I think there's a satisfaction that he has when we talk about a satisfaction. He said, all of those prophecies that I inspired those prophets to write about the suffering Messiah, that I got them to pen or they prophesied, they're being fulfilled right now. That's great. They're fulfilling my prophecies. I think also that he thought, I'm going to take him out of the grave, too. Romans 1, 4. A few days, I get the joy of bringing him out of the grave. 
right through those walls, not through a doorway, but through those walls. And I think he's that, and pretty soon he's going to send me to be the comforter to teach my students, his saved students. Think of that. Some of the thoughts that he, the Holy Spirit would have. We don't think about the Trinity's thoughts much, do we? Okay? But I want to ask you today, what is the meaning of Christ's death to us? We heard a message and a half this morning of that. Did we not? We did. Well, I think of first of all, the meaning of Christ's death to us is substitutionary sacrifice. He was punished for what we deserved. Okay? Redemption. We heard redemption this morning. He was buying us out of the slave market of sin. He was going to buy, with, buy us and free us from slavery to sin. His blood bought us. We're free. Think of that today. We're free from having to be slaves to sin. We're free from having to pay the penalty of our sins that we deserve. Reconciliation. Yeah, he reconciled us, changed us from the enemies of God to now the friends of God. Oh, how about that, folks? I mean, that's radical change. God's going to judge you, put you in hell forever, and now you're going to spend eternity with him as his friend. Yeah, and how about propitiation? Yes, God's justice has been satisfied and now we can have mercy instead of deserve just wrath upon us. Propitiation. Or how about John 17, 3? This is life eternal. What he gained for us, life eternal. What did Jesus say life eternal was? And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus, whom thou hast sent, whom you have sent. A personal relationship. That's what the death of Christ means. To know God intimately from now and forever. Growing and knowing God now and through eternity. Intimacy with God. How about Romans 8.32? And I've got three verses and... If you need to go, Brother Dave, some need to go and some of you need to stay and eat with us, but I'm just going to say this. Romans 8.32 He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him give us all things freely? Every good thing that we need, Christ's death, in not being spared, but getting death for us, has opened a treasure chest. Anything that's good for us, God it, has provided it through the death of Christ. Do you have anything good? Do you have any grandchildren that are saved? <laughs> you have any children that are saved? The death of Christ. Are you growing in the Lord through all things happening? The death of Christ. He spared him not. Now the death of Christ is conforming us with the options of all things working for good. And what is that? To be conformed to the image of his son. I want to close with one, but you guys can make any comments. I think around our fellowship today it'd be good if we just related to one another in, around the food what are some of the good things, other things that weren't mentioned in class? First Peter 3.18 talks about the just for the unjust, suffering it. The just for the unjust, to do what? To bring us to God. To usher us into the presence of God. Anybody want to make a quick comment about something that it means to you specifically? And then we'll close in prayer. Okay, what it means to the world. 
they miss out so much. What it meant to the Jews, they missed out, but they're going to know one day. What it meant to the Trinity, but what it means to us, the death of Christ. That would be something to be good for us to reflect upon this week. Anybody have a quick comment? If not, we're going to pause. Just, just uh, thinking of Hebrews when you mentioned the Spirit, uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, and how the Trinity is just so involved in every aspect of salvation? Okay. That offering was being done by the Holy Spirit. Amen. The eternal. Any others? That's good, Brother Fields. Any others? We can believe, like the men that you mentioned, who knew this others, but until we accept Him, surrender to Him, make Him our Lord, believing the devils believe, the demons they're very likely Putin is a religious man having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof is what, you're, what we're talking about but you know what Putin said he said the western world of Christianity has messed up Christianity and he talks about our homosexuality and everything that the western world has and he says, he, so he's, he's after a moral truth, but with the wrong method. That's strange, isn't it? Okay. And it's interesting, because communism and Marxism goes back to atheism. That's right. Basically, they hated anybody that was Christian. The true communist country is China. Yeah. Russian people as a whole are not the true communist. The dialectical materialism historically has been that but there has been a this religious group 71 percent of them say their orthodox russian church is their church now what all that means we don't know do we membership uh in a build a building or an organization membership in the family of god we don't know but he's, he's, he has made comments, apparently, that we are the immoral Western religion over here. And to some degree, we have demonstrated that Christianity hasn't changed us, so-called, right? Okay, 